There's not many of us in here today, so we can uh, be a little bit more intimate in, the, <laughs> in, in our conversation rather than just talk to slides, if, uh, if that's all right for, with everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Nick Rago. I'm a field CTO and product, uh, product strategist with, uh, with Salt Security. Uh, a little bit about my background. I've uh, been in the API space for quite a long time from on the development side to, uh, I was one of the original employees at a company, API management company called Kong. Um, moved out of that, uh, that organization uh, almost a couple of years now and moved over to the security side and into Salt Security. Uh, been involved with some of the largest digital transformation API management programs really all around the country. Uh, so uh, there's, uh, there's a lot I've seen at this, at this point. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, curious, Sort of the roles in the room. Uh, what you folks, what you folks do? There's only a few of us, so I don't mind going around and, and chatting. Uh, uh, we, obviously, we're here to talk about API security. I'm just kind of curious, kind of the draw, and where, where you folks coming from? Developers, API managers, developer, advocate. I'm Amazon. I'm a TPM. TPM is Amazon. Excellent. Yeah, I know what you do, and. <laughs> Um, cool. So let's do this. I'm going to focus on talking about the security piece here. And when you think of API security, I'm just kind of curious, what do you, what do you folks think of? If someone says, you know, I'm, I, I want to secure my APIs, what's the first thing that sort of pops into your mind? Good, and all of you here kind of working with APIs that are externally focused, focused so are fo um, or directed outside your organization or mostly internal, internal. Okay, yeah, and that's been, you know, that's been the big struggle is that from an API standpoint, we've seen a lot of in innovation, right? A lot of transformations, things moving from monolith to microservices. So what used to be a couple different entry points into an application now has, you know, now has hundreds. And while it's great that we're seeing all of this innovation and everything is API driven, we're also seeing that the bad actors and our nefarious users are also innovating as well in terms of how they're attacking. Um, what I wanted to do today is spend a little bit of time and we'll talk about really how attack techniques have changed in this particular work workshop. Uh, the reason today that we are, I mean, the reasons why today's security tooling are really not equipped to handle the type of attacks that we're seeing today. And then we'll also talk about how you can really protect yourself uh, from the bad actors that are targeting the APIs, what you can do uh, today. So I always ask folks, you know, how well do you know your APIs? And it's kind of a loaded question because first is how well do you know the APIs in that? Do you even know the APIs exist? What are out there? Um, we've, find out that in a lot of the assessments, you know, I work for Salt Security, one of the things we do and we'll talk about is API discovery and a lot of the assessments that we do, um, you know, there's upwards of over, you know, over um, in some cases, 2X the amount of APIs in some organizations that there's just no visibility. No one had any idea. They're not documented. They're not in a service catalog. I had no idea that these rogue APIs were uh, exposed to the outside. But that's just part of it is just kind of knowing what's out there. The other piece is how well do you know your APIs from from a usage perspective, what type of data do they handle? How are they structured? You know, how are they from a security posture standpoint? But then I, right now, probably the most important thing is how well do you know your APIs in terms of how vulnerable it makes you? What is it capable of, of in, a, you know, in really the bad way? Can it bring down your whole, you know, your whole application or your digital supply chain? Is it something that is leaky? Um, you know, one of the one of the things that we see is uh, application logic attacks today. Right, so uh, number one attacks. And I'll talk more about this as you get in as we get through this presentation. But uh, up on the screen right now is an example of an API attack, and it's always interesting when I when I'm working with uh, organizations or the projects that I'm in. When APIs, when systems are getting rolled out, or even when they're putting security in front of APIs today, the first thing that happens is 
let's get a gateway, let's get a, let's get a WAF, let's high five and let's move on to the next project. Um, this is a great request response payload here because this is actually showing us a typical attack type that we see today. And I don't know if just by looking at this, if anyone can actually glean what the issue is here. I'll walk you, I'll walk you through a little bit of it. Uh, but on the right, we can actually see up top here, I'm sorry, so the, the left part of the screen, my right up here, uh, this is a customer's endpoint that's actually getting hit. Uh, you can see v1 slash customers, we can see users authenticated and authorized. Um, over 95% of API attacks today are coming from a user that has authority to use that particular endpoint. So um, we can actually see uh, request payload in information here. We can see response payload, response head is response status code. So now the interesting thing here is that, let's say you have an API gateway that in your organization today or in your API stream today. From a gateway standpoint, this is a request and response that gets passed through all day long. Right? User has authentic authentication and authority to use this particular API. And schematically, if you're doing like an OAS um, uh, comparison of this, the request and response is exactly what you'd expect. So this re request gets through. From a WAF standpoint, there's no malformed data, there's no SQL injections, there's no known attack types in here. Nothing that would, you know, cross-site scripting, there's nothing that would raise a flag, right? So what did the attacker do and what's, in, in what's going on here? In this particular case, this is a dual ID BOLA. I'll talk more about BOLA, broken object level authorizations, uh, as we go through the, uh, the presentation here. But in this particular example, the attacker figured out, hey, once I'm authenticated into this API, and I can see the JOT token here, uh, the claim where I'm uh, with my identity, if I start to play around with the API parameters a little bit, and in this particular case, it's a cookie value where I'm changing a parameter, and if I look at the response, I'm not getting my data back, I'm getting somebody else's data back. I've gone through the WAF, I've gone through the API gateway, and I found a hole in application logic. Right. So now what I do is I stay low and slow, stay under the, the um, API gateway's rate limit, and I exfiltrate this data over time, right? So gone are the days where, in a lot of these API breaches that we're seeing where it's just one transaction, one request, and I'm pulling everything down. They're low and slow attacks that happen over the courses of weeks and months, and I'll give, you, give some examples of that as we go through this. Does this type of attack resonate with you and make sense? Okay, so then we sit back and say, well, how, how does this happen? And you know, the environments have actually changed. We went from, as I mentioned before, monolithic type interfaces where we had one interface to the application. We guarded it heavily with everything you know, in front and behind the door. You know, today, with the advent of microservices and the transformations and multi-cloud, we have tons of different entryways into the applications and all of them with different code, uh, code bases. Uh, different geographic development teams. So again, there's, there's a whole bunch of different entry points to actually monitor. And attackers know two, are, are, are really playing on two key security facts here. That security tools today lack major context. And I'll talk more about that, what, what that actually means as we go through this. And that the other thing is that only 30% of application logic permutations are typically tested as you go through your, uh, your SDLC or your development pipeline. What I mean by that is that, the, in, in that 30% number is, with, is really some of the best organizations in the world. So think of everything that's in your pipeline from, you know, your, from your code analysis to your specs, to your SAS, your DAS scanning, your testing that you're doing, your pen testing. In all of that testing and most of the rationale behind that testing, you're testing for known vulnerabilities, things that you've seen before. The issue is that APIs are unique. Every endpoint is unique. It has its own business logic, own application logic associated with it. So the best organizations in the world are typically only testing up to 30% or can test up to 30% of application logic permutation. So as a result of that, as I mentioned before, the one and done attacks are, thing, are really the, uh, a thing of the old. They're still out there and there's still obviously a need for to block those SQL injections and um, uh, and a lot of the signature-based attacks that we've seen in the past. But today, the attackers are doing something different. It's a low and slow type of attack. And a lot of the attack types that we're seeing today require some type of reconnaissance. It requires the attacker to learn the API before they can understand you know, what are the weak points of the API. And there's typically two elements of data that they're looking for, or, um, 
or two, two final results. The first is, can I find a leaky API? Can I hit APIs in certain ways, um, play around with different permutations of application you know, logic or, or parameters, hit in, in awkward sequences, trying to massage, you know, let's say, my, multiple microservices in ways that would open up some type of application logic flower hole. The second is to find weak points from an application logic standpoint for application specific DOS attacks, right? So denial services used to be something that we would throw tons and tons of requests at a particular endpoint or an application interface to take it down. Now the attacks are much more pinpointed that we see. I'm finding doing with reconnaissance first, what are all the endpoints or the ways that I can massage an API to create 500s, to create back in timeouts. And now I have an inventory of endpoints that I will hit the application with to try to take down the application with much less, you know, with much tr less uh, traffic throughput. Okay, so those are typically, you know, two um, uh, two elements that attackers are looking for today. Again, data and those soft spots in the application for an application level DOS. One of the hard things to do is find those attackers in reconnaissance. When I have a busy or a chatty API, how can I sort of cut through everything and really follow an attacker? over time, especially someone in reconnaissance. I want to capture, the, I want to capture the, that particular um, attacker before you know, they find any holes in my APIs. One of the big issues with API security is getting that context, watching not just you know, minutes worth of, trans, you know, minutes worth of uh, transactions, but let's say days, weeks, months worth of transactions is tough to do. It requires really a lot of compute power to do this. So a successful API security product on the runtime protection side, we'll talk more about sort of shift left and what you can do pre-production a little bit later, but on the runtime protection side really requires that sort of full context, the ability to look at not just large um, time intervals, but hundreds and hundreds of behavioral attributes as well. I, I, again, it's, it's just not diff, uh, malformed data types, it's bad sequences of calls that we've never seen before. Um, it's, uh, again, different permutations of, 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 of parameters in combinations we've never seen before. I mentioned this a little bit before. Some of the major attacks that we're typically seeing today in our research are application logic or business logic type of attacks against the APIs. Uh, are you folks, everyone in this room familiar with the uh, OWASP API top 10 uh, security vulnerabilities, in the list that OWASP put, has put out there? Um, number one vulnerability, and it is there for a reason, is a broken object level authorization, right? It's, again, it's a play on application logic look flaws, um, trying to get access uh, authority to uh, data or an application um, runtime or an interface that I normally wouldn't have. 40% of the successful API attacks that we've seen in our research are of the bowl of variety. Right? And I mentioned that before, and of those, over 95% of those attacks are from authorized entities. They're users that have the authority to use the API. So one of the, one of the toughest attack types to uncover is what's called the single ID BOLA. And that's when there's just only one element that's getting changed once I'm authenticated into an API. Um, and it's hard to discern whether or not I, have, I will have access to that API because it's a successful call that's being made. In this particular case, I'm actually showing you uh, a call that's being made. And again, from a request response standpoint, this is perfectly fine. Traditional security products are going to, uh, and toolings typically will allow this to happen all day long again because they don't have the context to know that this particular API call was made by the same user, let's say in this particular case, 108 times with different parameters in the last minute. This is showing you a per minute, but we've seen, we've seen attacks, especially you know, this year, where it's not just per minute, the attackers are very, you know, they're, they're slowing the frequency of the request down, and it's again, per hour, per day, per week, um, per month. So the ability to have that sort of context to figure out is my API getting poked and prodded and, and is there being reconnaissance being done is important. The other thing that's important, as I mentioned before, is this idea of uh, application level DOS. So in this particular case, uh, it, may not, it may be okay that you're getting a 500. That's just something that you'd expect to see in your access logs 
in your application logs. But again, the context is very different. If I know that this is a particular API consumer who a few minutes ago was then um, conducting requests that were doing things like that maybe look like this, application timeouts that we're seeing on the back end, right? I always tell people, you know, that the if someone is knocking at your door may not be a big deal. But if you had context to know that that person that was knocking at your front door last week was trying to open the back door that you weren't home with looking in your windows a week ago and was taking a nap on your deck two weeks prior to that, that knock on the front door now means something different to you. Right? So this is an important part and a, and a big problem in API security for a lot of organizations. And there's been a lot of real world breaches that have occurred because a lot of these organizations were using the traditional application stack in front of their APIs. Um, in the case of uh, Facebook, it was a breach where two microservices were kind of colliding with each other. If you're familiar with it, this was almost two years ago now. This was um, Facebook's uh, view as API. So when you're in Facebook into the, in their interface, you can do view as, and I can view you know, my, my profile as another entity. Well, someone figured out if I exercise that API in conjunction with the video upload API that was connected to it, what the Facebook application was doing through the API is it was returning access tokens for the view as entity. So what the attacker was able to do is through that API and do this over a period of 18 months was able to actually exfiltrate and harvest user access tokens for over 50 million Facebook users. Okay. Facebook had no idea this was going on for 18 months that this code application logic flaw existed in their API code until the attacker got a little greedy and kind of turned up the turned up, the, um, uh, turned up the, the heat a little bit in terms of the, the frequency of the request, and they finally noticed something on the network and uncovered this particular breach. The Experian one was an interesting one as well because that application logic flaw was one where, uh, with a partner API, where someone figured out if I am using the Experian API. And if I just know your name and address, I can go through a telephone book and, and, and online and capture that information. And I put zeros in as a birth date, I'll get your uh, credit risk factors and credit score information coming back from the Experian API. So how is it with every security product, a great DevSecOps model, was that missed? Again, it was an application logic permutation that no one actually tested for. What happens if I put in valid information with um, uh, with zeros as a birth date. Uh, LinkedIn was, a, was another big one with someone sort of scraping, I forget it was over 50 or 60 million different user accounts from LinkedIn, able to capture profile information through the APIs there. Peloton was, an, was another great one where uh, the devices were kind of phoning home to an unauthenticated endpoint um, uh, that uh, Peloton was trying to obfuscate that was uncovered. And if you knew what that endpoint was, you were able to actually pull anybody's information um, outside, uh, outside of their profile, even if they had their profile set to private. So as I mentioned before, every API is unique. Every endpoint is unique with its own logic. So signatures don't work. All day long, there's attacks that are coming through these, and these organizations based on the tooling that they have just are not picking them up. If we take a look at the breakdown between, from a security perspective, what a WAF API gateway and what schema analysis does for you, um, and this is something, if you're interested, you can stop by, we're in the, in the partner pavilion there downstairs we, on Village. Um, I can share this information and, and get you a copy of this information. But this is, this is important data to take in because, again, for, as far as the OWASP API top 10 is concerned, this is what's typically in the existing security stack in front of your APIs. And this is what's getting missed. Gartner and OWASP themselves have come out with comments basically saying, listen, uh, API gateways and WAFs um, are just not going to cut it from a security standpoint. And timing is everything. Over the last couple of years, AI and ML technology um, and uh, sort of the ability to run this particular technology at cloud scale uh, in the cloud has given now the, the birth of API security products and capability where we're now able to capture context to really flush out these type of reconnaissance and um, long-term uh, um, long low and slow API attacks um, in a way that you really had no visibility to capture before. 
Um, so much so that Gartner kind of broke out API security into its own in its own category uh, last year. So again, this is just because technically it's so much different than the other traditional security products are out there to solve this problem. It, you have to compile a lot of data to be able to behaviorally understand how your APIs are used before you can actually flush out and identify when someone is misusing them. So one of the one of the major questions that folks ask is, well, how do I protect APIs that are already in production today? And there's there's really three major components of this. For APIs that are already in production today, the first is understanding from an API discovery standpoint. And I'll go ahead and build all this out. Um, from an API discovery standpoint, what is even out there from an inventory perspective? You'll know, you'll know about your major APIs, but you, a lot of organizations are surprised to know that, hey, we've rolled out, we've rolled out an API gateway platform. I had no idea that this, there's, another, there's a Kubernetes cluster that's exposing you know, 500 different endpoints out to the outside world. I had no idea that was there. Um, API discovery also is getting, your, getting an understanding about how the APIs are being used and classifying the data inside of them. Again, a lot of folks will roll out everything through their API gateway, they'll expose these endpoints, but from a data classification standpoint, do not have a good handle on what are the data elements inside of it. You know, what are the ones that are handling from a GDPR standpoint email addresses? What are the ones that are handling uh, PCI information or handling social security numbers? Again, have the ability to sort of inventory all that and understand it. Uh, the second is sort of is the runtime protection. This is uh, this gives you immediate risk reduction, right? Because this gets deployed in production and will will learn your APIs for you, behaviorally how they're used, and then we'll come back and let you know, uh, again, in real time, if anyone is, uh, is misusing the APIs. And then the last piece is feeding shift left security. And you can do this already today with APIs that are already in production. I want a technology to be, to be sitting in runtime that will essentially turn my real world attackers into pen testers. Anything that I'm finding running in the wild against my production environment, I wanna be able to cycle any findings back through the development cycle. And so that's a key component of this as well. Uh, for APIs that are um, cycling through the development or things or APIs that you're gonna be greenfielding, new, new application endpoints that you're gonna be developing, uh, a couple major additions typically need to be added to the pipeline that aren't there today. Um, first and foremost, there are a lot of organizations today that still are not documenting and specking out endpoints before, uh, before they're developed. So um, design first or spec first development is still kind of utopian for a lot of organizations. This is really, really important. So a lot of organizations, especially as they start to look towards new APIs and greenfield new, um, uh, new application endpoints, they really need to spec these things out. We need to put them in a service catalog, a developer portal. That's kind of the first piece. That becomes the contract in terms of what you're gonna develop. This then gives you in the pipeline the ability to leverage API security products to do things such as uh, you know, linting and OAS security analysis. I want to make sure that how I'm designing the API adheres to the security standards that we're putting in place. Again, that, that um, documentation or that, that specification becomes the API's contract. The second piece is everything in the pipeline is important from a SAS DAS scanning. Again, I wanna test for the known bad things as I go through the pipeline, but how do I capture things such as those single ID bolas, those um, uh, dual ID bolas, the OWASP API top 10 that I showed you, but I wanna be able to do that in production. So how do I behaviorally learn the APIs to be able to uh, understand if these application logic flaws exist if I'm only testing 30% of my application logic permutation? Uh, there are, um, in, again, I work for Salt Security, um, and we just released a brand new testing vulnerability scanning technology. It's an AI-based technology that lives in your performance testing and in your staging environment. And its whole purpose is when you're kind of getting ready to release uh, your, uh, your API code into production, this particular technology does one san a quick sanity check, behaviorally learns the APIs, and then uses AI to actually build synthetic attackers that will go out, do reconnaissance, and actually poke and prod to find the application logic flaws that you may not be testing um, in, uh, uh, in the pipeline.
Okay. And then the last piece is being able to take what you're finding there and, and move this over into your runtime protection as well. Okay. Now I have a good understanding of how these APIs should be used. I now can enforce this in production, but at the same time I've cast that wide net where I can, um, 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 where I'm uh, constantly learning how uh, any new endpoints are being um, deployed into production so that I can capture and, uh, and alert on any nefarious usage. Other general API security best practice, as I mentioned before, documentation. The other thing that we're typically seeing is that API gateways are severely underutilized out there in the wild. Um, I'm still going into a lot of organizations where I'm seeing APIs being exposed, you know, let's say in the AWS world, just with an ALB and have their endpoints exposed that way. Or they're using sort of cloud provided API gateways, but pretty elementary, right? They're just maybe using it as a form to, uh, to publish the APIs. Um, taking, full, taking full advantage of API gateway technology, especially the abstraction capability of that technology is important. Uh, again, I need to have, there's from a security standpoint, there's just a lot of advantage of abstracting things such as authentication, authorization, uh, validation and checks into the gateway and not relying on the developers to do that for each and every, you know, all of the different code bases and each and every uh, endpoint. Um, always like to remind folks that shift left is a marathon. It's not a substitute for runtime protection. They go hand in hand. Even with the best shift left and all these, you know, all these great, all this great tooling that you can add to your CI CD pipeline, you're still not going to cover every different single permutation of the application logic or business logic of your API endpoints. So having the ability to have, uh, it's necessary to have something in your runtime that will again, constantly watch, learn your APIs for you and capture and highlight for you when we're seeing, when you're seeing nefarious usage or API usage in a manner that you've never seen before. Um, Hacker One bug bounty programs have paid huge dividends for a lot of organizations. I don't know if you folks do any of that uh, in your organizations today, uh, but uh, it's been pretty amazing in a lot of organizations that we've seen when you actually introduce a Hacker One bug bounty program. You'd be very, very surprised as the, 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 um, the personnel and the people in your organization that will step up and find things. A lot of them are not developers. You'll be surprised who comes from sales or marketing and what they actually find um, if you kind of hang out one of these programs uh, and encourage people to kind of poke and prod against their APIs like an attacker would. Um, the last piece I just wanted to mention is I'm actually downstairs. Uh, if you're interested, we can talk about anything that's up on the screen here today and I can actually walk you through um, the way that we're set up here today. I'm on a bar borrowed laptop so the demo, <laughs> demo environment's not showing real well when I went and looked at it here. Um, but um, I'm happy to walk you through a demo downstairs if anybody's here interested in actually seeing the product, uh, our particular product and, uh, and what we're doing. Uh, I will leave you with this. Um, as I mentioned before, I work for Salt Security. Um, we were the pioneer in the API security space. Uh, we've been out on the market uh, a few years now. We're the only uh, API security product out there today um, that has a runtime protection uh, patent that's been granted. We're providing customers three, the, those three major deliverables I mentioned before, the ability to discover your APIs that are out there in play. How are they structured? How are they used? What data are they handling? Are they adhering to best, uh, best practices from a security standpoint? Um, we were the pioneer in runtime protection for APIs. Um, so again, behaviorally modeling your APIs, understanding how they're supposed to be used, how they're being used and highlighting for you um, you know, any nefarious usage, any anomalies. Um, this, uh, from this particular standpoint, a lot of technologies are not the same. So you'll hear the AI and the ML buzzword for um, everybody in, the, in and out of the security space. Uh, time matters, uh, maturity matters. One of the big differentiators that this particular technology or the salt security technology has in the space is that you, the AI is mature enough and that you're only gonna be alerted to the incidents and events and the anomalies that you need to be, right? Over 99% in, in, in the research that we've done of anomalous behavior is not is anomalous behavior I do not want to get an alert on. The last thing in the world I want, why a lot of organizations have struggled with ML and AI technology, uh, is that 
I don't want something else filling up the sock. I don't want a thousand new incidents a day that I have to have hire a team of people to go through. I want to have a mature technology that's only going to show me when there's something I need to be worried about. And that's, you know, and that's one of our uh, kind of sort of claim to fame or secret sauce here is that the AI technology that we're actually using, the algorithms and the maturity of it is going to be something manageable. You don't have to hire a new team. And it will flush out, um, uh, it will fl flush, flush out um, uh, anomalous behavior that really nothing else in the market can today. The, the last piece is the security posture. And uh, I mentioned today uh, a little bit how we're introducing some technology there. Um, you're going to be seeing new announcements come from SALT in that regard as well in terms of what we are doing for organizations earlier on in the developer, uh, developer lifecycle. Um, with that, I just wanted to open it up and see if you folks had any, had any questions. It could be around the space, around the SALT technology in particular. Sure. So let's say this AI algorithm that has been built, it brings in certain false positives. Because we're looking at so many scenarios and some of the scenarios will not be, you know, that threatening to the application, but they kind of impact the availability of the platform to the users because of those. Uh, is there something that you do to mitigate that or yeah, I'm not I'm not sure I'm following. You run that by me one more time. So, Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah, th there's a couple of key components to this. First is that the nature of an API attack typically requires some type of reconnaissance against the API. So in a vast majority of cases, you're going to capture them doing that reconnaissance. I want to capture them poking and prodding before they actually are doing something bad. So, And, and it's a crawl, walk, run, right? At the very beginning of this, when you, when you turn this on, you're not going to be blocking initially, right? Just like with anything else, when you deploy a WAF, we're going to be watching it first. We're going to be making sure that everything's kind of tuned in and play uh, the way we want. When you get to, to the point where, you, where um, everything's sort of baked in behaviorally enough, you can get confident enough where you would uh, turn the auto blocking on. Um, and, you know, and with us, with that integration, we have blocking capability that we can do in line, but we typically integrate like we would with, almost act as a, as a SOAR component, if you will, with whatever you already have in line today. So it could be an API gateway, a WAF, it could be, your, uh, um, it could be a load balancer, it could be your identity provider. These are all things that we integrate with out of the box to actually then um, you know, block those components. But it's, it's, um, it's a good question. So out of the box, we definitely wouldn't be blocking right away. You just wanna make sure you get a good understanding in, in, of what's going on. It was from our research team, yeah. Yep. And so that was by uh, false positives, but also you have false negatives. Do you have data on how many things that you shouldn't get through do get through? So, yeah, so there's, there's two sides to you don't, you don't want your stock to go full, um, but you also don't want to miss things. Yeah, not, um, I'd have to look to see if there's any research around. On, on that particular piece of it. But again, at the end of the day, it's, it's really up to you in terms of you can influence the, the, the modeling as well. Um, we do also capture and report on every single anom anomaly as well. So that's part of it. It's just, do I want to be alerted to that typically? Are there any anomalies that will, um, that will get through? Uh, yeah, again, depending on, so the, the, the intelligence behind what the technology will do is it will figure out what's behind the endpoint. So for example, if the endpoint, if it, if it sees anomalous activity on an endpoint 
that is a pretty benign endpoint where there's no sensitive data behind it. There's no PII, there's no PCI data versus an endpoint that sees a single anomaly that has that type of, well, that's something that's actually weighed out by the engine. Um, typically, it also will, if it will also look at the amount of data that's being consumed. So what I mean by that is if there's a request that's coming back, it's an anomalous type of request, and that endpoint would typically have you know, one, uh, let's say, you know, one element of PII with it, but now I'm seeing 10,000 come back. Well, then that, again, it's one transaction, but now the, the weight is, is, uh, is changed heavily. It looks all of, at all of that. So again, part of the secret sauce is, is really weighing all of those attributes on the endpoints themselves. So it's not just behaviorally how the endpoint's being used, it's what's behind the endpoint that gets, that gets weighed into the engine. No, no, it's a good question. Yeah, it's 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 constant. It's constant. Um, it's it's constant. I mean, there's a reason why the majority of our companies are in engineering. It's uh, it's not an easy problem to solve, and the amount of data that we're ingesting is is ginormous. Um, and to me, make it even more complicated, the window of analysis is is large. Some of the you know some of the attacks that we detect are attacks that are taking place you know, dripping attacks that are taking place, you know, one to two, in some cases, transactions a day. Um, so again, being able to have that context and then being able to say, well, wait a second, these, I only have 50 different data points over the last month. This is, but this is something I need to alert you to is, uh, is important. The other big piece of this is to, to glue all of this together, it takes a ton of compute power to do this. Uh, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of behavioral attributes. So again, it's not just a simple behavioral anomaly. It's then, that's one part of it. Yes, this is, this is a behavioral anomaly, but it's then figuring out everything related to the endpoint as I mentioned before. What's behind it? Have I seen this particular consumer before? To figure out, is this something I need to, you know, uh, is this something I should be alerting you to or not? Uh, so the, the algorithms and everything that we're using are constantly getting updated. Uh, you have, with our particular technology, you do have the ability to influence the models as well. So when you see something, um, you can actually say this is okay. The actual technology will, will take that back, back into the, its modeling for your environment, and then we'll, we'll adjust accordingly. Uh, and then like with everything else, there's knobs on everything that you can, uh, that you can twist and turn. One of the, the big things that we wanted to do is that this is something that a lot of organizations wanted to get into. Um, this sort of behavioral analysis from a security standpoint of their APIs, but they didn't want something too noisy and they wanted something that they could, they could trust. So that's why we spent a lot, a, a lot of time there and understand there's, there's sort of pluses and minuses. By the nature of API um, uh, attacks, you typically are not gonna see or get alerted to the first type of pokes and prods, uh, but, right? but it's when the AI technology can kind of stitch the story together that it will actually then be able to to highlight it and bring it to focus for you. There's typically a delay, right? So it learns the APIs. And then for us, with the cloud scale big data engine that we're using, we typically can uh, build behavioral templates. They're automatic in about four hours. But as we watch more and more, there's just more elements to the, to the knowledge that the, that the engine will actually pick up. Um, the delay is typically about, uh, about a minute or so. Uh, once these behavioral templates are actually uh, created, and it's done in multiple levels. There's, um, there's components that will say, okay, what's an anomaly in the last minute? There's other components that say, well, what's an anomaly for this endpoint looking at transactions over the last 90 days, right? Those alerts may come back, may take a little longer to come back because of the crunching that takes place sort of behind the scenes. But... Um, Yeah, so it, it's, it's a good question. A couple of things happen. Obviously, you get alerting. Um, alerts are essentially in a couple different flavors. The first is you know, for, the, for your SOC. This is something bad that's going on. The second are alerts that are more geared towards uh, the SDLC, the development lifecycle. Right? So if I find a vulnerability, the AI technology, let's say it's Ebola, um, 
will actually come back and send an alert to a JIRA or a GitHub issues or a Git bucket. And the idea is that, hey, it looks like you have a vulnerability here, but it's, I always tell people it's sort of the doctor's prescription on how to fix it. You gotta make sort of this claim inside the JOT token, the authenticated user matches in the, the example I gave earlier, the, that particular cookie element or respond back with a 400. So that's, that's one, uh, one big piece of it is doing that. The second is the blocking. So you decide at what point you're comfortable. And you may decide it's only bolas or it's only particular um, event types that you want to enable blocking on. And then the blocking can be done whatever makes the most sense. IP blocking is pretty useless in the API security world. Um, so we do a lot more success, have a lot more success with the identity providers. Use the endpoints and the identity providers to actually make sure that a particular user can't mint access tokens anymore. But even sometimes that's, that can be playing, you know, whack-a-mole as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Any other questions, folks? I think it's been great. So I missed a lot of, probably a good candidate to see a demo. Um, but agentless and no code changes. So how do you, how do you assert yourself yeah. Yep. Yeah, great, great question. Uh, could be all the above. I always tell people agentless is the goal. Uh, and defend, depending on how you define agent, <laughs> you can argue with me if, if there's an agent or not. But um, at the end of the day, it's we want to be policy based. So for example, if you find your integration point is going to be um, with uh, an API gateway. We have over 100 different data collection options that we have today. So if it's uh, MuleSoft, Kong, Apigee, we have policies for all the major providers. In the microservice world, it could be a daemon set, a sidecar injector that gets deployed, integration with an ingress controller, um, F5, uh, multiple integrations like with load balancers, uh, Akamai, Cloudflare. Yeah, because at the end of the day, we need to be seeing decrypted traffic and what's in, the important piece about this is it's kind of a, especially for regulated environments where you're worried about sensitive data, because we're looking at, you can just do like access log type of integration for discovery, but you can't do the data classification. You don't get the full breadth of the API security piece to find like the bolas of the world and those things. Um, so what we've done, we've come, in, we've come up with sort of this, with this uh, layered approach to the security. And it's important uh, for a couple of different things. One is when we capture data from your environment, we have a hybrid technology that lives in your cloud, in your data center, wherever you want to provide it. Could, you could have multiple if you wanted. Uh, what this hybrid technology will do is it translate everything to metadata. At the end of the day, the security platform is based on metadata. So I, we want to take your request response payload and we want to translate that into a descriptor of the traffic. So it's an HTTP post. It's got 10 parameters. Parameter one is called XYZ. It's always a 10 digit number. Parameter three is always a social, US social security number. So in that regard, think of us like a data loss prevention technology in that we have hundreds of different classifications right out of the box that will do that. So that's important because this data goes to the cloud engine. The cloud engine builds the behavioral templates and then we can do the first level of detection here. Uh, all of it. So the behavioral templates and everything that runs on the hybrid is, is a key piece of this as well, because we'll do the first level analysis here as well if you deploy a hybrid server. Um, the, the cloud scale gives us the low and slow protection. So this gives us the ability to crunch data over very large windows to be able to identify you know, anything that this, this might have missed. Yep. It's the MLAI in the process. Yep. And again, this would be something, I'm, if, if you're interested, I'm happy to show downstairs if anyone's interested to take a look at this. Um, we also can set up another time if you're interested and show you Zooms. One of the big things our organization does is we do, um, do uh, security assessments for organizations as well, um, where you basically pick, you know, pick an integration point, we'll capture data there, we'll kind of show you from a discovery standpoint what was found, um, and then we'll kind of really, depending on the environment, if it's production, you'll have uh, typically a lot, of, a lot of great stuff there. If not, if it's a dev or staging environment, um, we'll help you set up some attack simulations to actually show you how the detection technology um, works. Cool. So with that, I want to thank everybody for your time and your patience today. And thanks.